Thank you very much, Diana. Thank you very much, Ioannis, for inviting me. Um, it's the first time I'm doing one of these virtual seminars, so I hope I'll do this correctly. Uh, I, I want to talk about two types of data that we're working with a lot, isoflight sequencing to measure DNA methylation and RNA sequencing. So there will be two parts, but before we go into that, I've been asked to quickly introduce myself and the group. So on the top you see the people who have been involved in the projects I'm going to present today. Dimos, Lucas, Maria, who was a, an undergraduate student who is now in the Netherlands. And the DNA methylation projects, they, they all were in collaboration with Dirk Schübler, who is also group leader at the Friedrich Miescher Institute, and his former postdoc, Robbie Moore, who is now a professor at the University of Geneva. And I'd like to thank those people for their great contributions in these projects. So this is, this is like a summary of what kind of things we are interested in in my group. We're interested in gene expression, and with that, we, we were mostly thinking up to the level of RNA, not so much to the level of proteins, just due to a lack of data, actually. There's not so much proteomics data at our institute, but there is a lot of data coming from all the other layers in this whole process, just naming a few here, um, starting from the DNA sequence itself, polymorphisms that affect the transcription, then the, the, the state of the chromatin, the proteins that are bound to the DNA, the accessibility of the chromatin, the positioning of the nucleosomes, the structure, the higher order structure of the chromatin, then the transcriptional process itself, the translational process, proteins bound to the RNA. So you can see next generation sequencing is really a huge tool set and you can look at many, many different layers in this whole process of, of gene expression. The data sets um, that we're looking at, they come mostly from our experimental collaborators within the institute, and our, our questions are as diverse as the biology that they are studying. So we don't have a strong focus in terms of a biological question or a biological system. We're more focused on the, on the data, on the, on the ways to process it, and on the ways to interpret it biologically. These data sets have turned out to be extremely rich. They usually measure one thing, but they give you additional information on top. To, to give you an example, bisulfide sequencing is used to measure cytosine methylation. But you can, for example, also look at the mutual information between neighboring cytosines and whether maybe they're co-regulated by, by the same underlying process. Or to give you another example, RNA sequencing is usually done to get just gene expression levels or steady-state RNA concentrations. But of course, you can also use it to find new genes. You can study promoter or poly-A site usage, and of course, transcript structure, just to name a few things. So that's the theme of, of today's talk. I'd like to, to give you two examples where we're using these NGS data sets to find additional things to what they actually have been generated for. I will start <clears throat> talking about DNA methylation at the beginning. So let's look at DNA methylation patterns. Um, just as a very quick introduction to DNA methylation, we're using bisulfide sequencing to measure that. It's a, it's a biochemical trick where you treat your DNA with bisulfide, which leads to deamination of unmethylated cytosines, turning them into uracils. But the methylated cytosines will not be converted, and then if you if you do PCR and sequencing, you basically see T's in the place where you have the unmethylated cytosines. And of course, <clears throat> you can't just align those reads back to the genome like normal reads because you would have many mismatches in that case. So, so the method we, we developed a few years back, and actually a lot of other people also developed similar methods, is to remove all the C's both from the genome and the reads basically doing the alignment in a three-letter alphabet, three letter alphabet space. And then once you have the alignment positions, you can put back the Cs and you can read out the unmethylated or methylated states or, or sequencing errors for that matter. So uh, if you're interested in that kind of thing, you might want to have a look at our Quasar package that implements these alignment strategies, amongst other things. <clears throat> 
So how does methylation look like? <clears throat> I'm only talking about mammalian systems here because that's, that's what the Kshuvler is studying. Um, in mammalian system, you have uh, genome-wide DNA methylation occurring only in the context, or almost only in the context, of CPG dinucleotides. And this, the genome is also depleted for those dinucleotides, except for the so-called CPG island regions. And if you look at the default methylation state of the CPGs, typically they're unmethylated in the CPG islands, indicated here by these, this yellow color, and they're methylated everywhere else. And what has been known since a long time is that these CPG islands, they tend to occur close to remote regions or transcript start sites. And if you methylate those regions, they usually repress the, the close-by genes. So they're thought of as regulatory regions in the genome. About two-thirds of the genes actually have such a CPG island very close to the transcript start site. And Initial knowledge about the role of DNA methylation in mammals has been really focused on these CPG islands. But before the era of NGS, we didn't really know how methylation would look like genome-wide. So that's why a few years back, together with the Schubler lab, we, we were generating genome-wide data sets using this bisulfide sequencing method. And here you see how the CPG methylation patterns would look like for a short piece, in this case, on mouse chromosome 10. Um, each dot that you see here along a stretch of about six or seven megabases, each of these dots represents one given CPG. And on the y-axis, you see the, the methylation level, which is just like the, the fraction of methylated over total reads that we get for that CPG. You can see that the default state is really to be fully methylated. Most of the CPGs, they, they can be found up here. That's, that's an embryonic stem cell. Sorry, it's not mouse. It's human, actually. And you see the average level is maybe around 90% methylation. And in between, you can see these, these stripes, which are nothing else than groups of close-by CPGs that show lower levels of methylation. So if you, if you plot the location of the CPG islands that I just mentioned, you see those often correspond to these CPG islands. There are, however, in addition to these two states, these regions here, which are also stripes, so also regions of local hypermethylation, which do not correspond to CPG islands. And that was kind of a new observation that wasn't known at the time, and we were, of course, wondering what they would correspond to. If, if I plot, if I look, systematically identify those regions genome-wide and I plot the number of CPGs per region versus the average methylation in the region, you can see that you get really two populations of regions. This is one of the few examples that I've ever seen in, in biological data where you truly get bimodal distributions so that you can really say there's two different things. while one, one population are the well-known CPG islands, or completely unmethylated regions, where you have lots of CPGs and really no residual methylation. And these are these other stripes, these new things that we discovered that have, on average, a bit more methylation, that have only few CPGs. Actually, they have the, the low CPG content that you find mostly in the genome outside of CPG islands. And they also tend to be far away from genes. They don't enrich in promoters like, like these CPG island-like regions do. So what are they? <clears throat> we started comparing them to different other types of, of data. Here, for example, you see just a, a zoom in into a smaller region in the genome that has one CPG island and four of these LMR regions. And if you compare that to DNAs1, uh, sequencing data, which measures accessibility, you can see that, that each of these regions basically corresponds to a peak in the accessibility profile. So to, to put it very simply, the CPG ions plus these additional regions pretty much correspond to any accessible region in the genome. And when you look at chromatin, histone modifications, 
and also transcription factor binding, you find a lot of these things also enriched in these regions. So you have these LMRs here, in the middle would be the CPG islands. And especially the histone modifications told us that these regions could actually be enhancers. Uh, in particular, you see they have a lot of K4 monomethylation, which is typical for enhancers. It's not found at promoters usually. And the K4 trimethylation, which is a typical CPG island or promoter mark, is, is usually lower in enhancers. So this profile fit very well with what people knew at the time about enhancer regions. So, so we were basically working on the hypothesis that what we discovered there were actually active enhancers. And to put this to the test, Robbie Moore used a, a reporter construct where a luciferase reporter gene is driven by a, a, a weak promoter. And he cloned 12 of these elements that, that we discovered into that construct. And, and indeed, 10 or 11 of these show a boost in the luciferase activity. So kind of confirming that these are really having promoter or enhancer activity in, in the ESLs. This is another way to test this, <clears throat> because of course we were wondering why, why are these regions hypomethylated? Is it the binding of the transcription factor that causes it? Or is it maybe the other way around, that they're somehow demethylated, giving access now or allowing the transcription factor to bind? And experiments like this one here convinced us that it's really the transcription factor that causes it. So we took a piece of E. coli DNA. And if you bring that into the genome of an ES cell, by default, the CPGs that are contained in it will be fully methylated, indicated here by this reddish color. If you plant a transcription factor binding site motif, in this case for CTCF, you see we can detect binding of CTCF to this element by chip, and we see that the CPGs are now low in their methylation level. But if we plant a mutated motif, so just swapping two base pairs actually, the binding is, is almost abolished and so is the hypomethylation. So it's, we think the binding of the transcription factor is necessary and sufficient to create this. How it actually works mechanistically, we're still looking into that, we still don't know. But um, we looked at several transcription factors. We also used um, the polymorphisms that are contained <coughs> in, in our cell line. We have uh, a few binding sites here again, the CTCF motif, that have heterozygous uh, single nucleotide variants and that allow us to classify both the bisulfite sequencing and the chip sequencing reads to measure them allele specifically. And what we get there is basically, if we compare the difference of CTCF binding between the alleles with the difference of methylation, that if you get increased binding, you get decreased methylation and vice versa. So you get this expected anti-correlation between binding and methylation. And of course, if you, if you accept that, that it's the binding of the transcription factors that create these elements, it's, it's not surprising to to see that if you compare different cell types that express different transcription factors, you will find some elements that are cell type specific. And if you look into the sequences of these elements, that you find motifs for transcription factors that are also expressed in a cell type specific manner. So basically, you can, can take those elements, look for motif enrichments, and you can identify, for example, in ESL specific elements that they are that there is an overrepresentation of pluripotency transcription factors, um, like SOX2 or OCT4. Or if you look in hematopoietic stem cells, you find some of the factors that have already been known to play an important role for these cells. So in a way, you, it's, a, it's also a, a possible way to find out the transcription factors that are important for, for cell identity. And with that, that's that's an older story. I don't want to spend too much time on that unless you have any questions. Um, I'd just like to mention very quickly that in addition to the three types of elements that I just described, um, in some methylomes we find a fourth type of pattern, which, which looks very different. So here on the top, you see again the, the human ESL 
methylone, which is like what we call a nice methylone. <clears throat> then below that, you have IMR90 fibroblasts. And you can easily see they, they look very different. They have these regions that, are, that have been first described by Lister in 2009 and have been termed partially methylated domains. Because if you calculate an average methylation level, it's, it's around 50% in these regions compared to the 90% you find outside. So that, I guess that's why he called them partial. I, we don't think it's a good name because if you, if you look at them, they're actually not partially methylated. The individual CPGs, some of them are fully methylated and others are not methylated at all. And here you see the distribution of the methylation levels in these IMR90 PMDs. It's almost a uniform distribution or methylation levels. And that was striking us as strange because while they were talking about chaotic methylation and unregulated, this doesn't look like random to us. Something that would be random you would think would more scatter around an average methylation level because the cells wouldn't agree with each other. So on average, when you, when you look at all cells and calculate the population average, you should get something that is maybe more like a Gaussian, maybe somewhere around 50%. That's not at all what we're seeing. We're seeing CPGs that are 100% methylated. That means all the cells, they agree that this CPG should be methylated. And just the neighboring CPG can be, can be at 0% methylation. Again, meaning all the cells agree on the methylation state. That's not random at all. So we started comparing these PMD regions across different cell types. And the surprising finding was that the methylation levels are highly correlated. <coughs> the correlation coefficients are as high as they can get, given the error bars in our methylation measurements. Here you see the comparison between IMR90 and foreskin fibroblasts, on average correlate about 0.8. So we were wondering what drives this kind of pattern. And you could say the, the LMRs I described in the first part were driven by the binding of transcription factors. So in the end, it was the underlying DNA sequence that recruits the, the factors. I think also in this case, it's, it's actually the underlying sequence. Um, this has also been published. So if you're interested in the details, you can read this up. You can predict these methylation levels with sequence features, for example, with the local content of dinucleotides. And we think it reflects probably the, the, the preference of the methylation machinery, which surfaces in these regions that are usually thought as being inactive, not very well maintained, because probably they're heterochromatic. And so the methylation is not maintained as actively as it is maintained in, in the intervening regions. Um, also, this part we, we implemented in a methyl, methyl seeker R package that allows you to find these regions genome-wide if you have bisulfide sequencing data. And with that, I'd like to summarize the, the part about methylation. Basically, I showed you two kind of patterns um, that are caused by, by DNA sequence in the end. The first one by the binding of the transcription factors, the second one is maybe more fun to find it, but, but biologically maybe not so relevant, but it probably shows the, the preference of the methylation machinery. And, and uh, so these would be like first examples of what you can pull out from NGS data sets in addition to why people generate them in the first place. Yes? Has anybody done the ICBI um, good question. I should repeat the question for the people who are listening from remote. <laughs> the question was whether the IMR90 cells have been looked at using high C or basically any technique that allows you to see the high order chromatin structure. Um, that's a good question. I, I actually don't know, but that's something we should check. We, we, we know that the PMDs, they, they tend to um, correspond to the TAD structure. But I don't know if that's the case in IMR90, but I would expect so, actually. Yes. 
Okay, so with that, I'd like to go now to the second part, which is more recent, and which deals with RNA-seq data. So if you think of, of RNAs in a cell, um, they, part of them you will find in the nucleus, part of them are actually in the process of being matured, so maybe partial transcripts still containing the introns, maybe the lariat that has been spliced out, partially spliced forms, then they will be exported and probably the most of the molecules we will find in the cytoplasm. If we do RNA-seq, we grind up the whole cell and we get reads or counts from all of those species. Um, a lot of people are studying the different steps in this process. And, and of course, they even develop specific methods to, to measure particular steps in this process, like global run-on sequencing or nascent seq that nascent seq for example that just precipitates the RNA that still sticks to the chromatin and is supposed to be a very fresh newly made RNA or cell fractionation you can just separate nuclei from cytoplasm and sequence them separately that's experimentally challenging or let's say at least more difficult than just doing the standard RNA seq that you might usually do and so if you think about measuring transcription, I just mentioned global run-on sequencing. In this case, you, you pulse the cells with a nucleotide analog that you can then use to pull out the freshly made RNAs or the, the nascent seq. As I said, you precipitate the, the transcript still sticking to the chromatin or the cellular fractionation techniques. They are experimentally definitely more involved than standard RNA-seq, but there were indications that maybe that information you get with these kind of experiments could in part at least also learn from standard RNA-seq data. There was an older paper by Amit Zeisel where he used probes on affymetric, affymetric exon arrays that locate to intronic regions to, to get an estimate for the transcription. And later on there was a paper by Amr et al, where they used RNA sequencing data and they looked at the, the read coverage within the introns, um, giving evidence of co-transcriptional splicing because it tended to, to increase along the intron. There was even a very sophisticated dynamic model fit to RNA seq data where people were trying to estimate transcription rate, splicing rate, and all of these things. Um, that turned out to be maybe going too far because there wasn't enough data. So in that paper, they suggest to make groups of hundreds of genes to, to get the power to fit these parameters. But it was obvious if you maybe don't go that far, if you, if you take a step back, you might be able to get it from a standard RNA-seq data for single genes. And that was Dimos Kaidatsis in my group who discovered oscillating genes and could prove that it's a transcriptional oscillation by, by looking at intronic reads. So what do we mean by taking a step back? <clears throat> Basically, we're, we're doing this in a, in a contrast setting. We're comparing two conditions, like wild type and knockout, or healthy and diseased, or treated, untreated. And we're basically splitting the RNA-seq reads that we're getting into two groups, the ones we get that map to exons and the ones that map to introns. And then we're calculating a full change between these two conditions separately at the level of introns and at the level of exons. And in the end, we compare these two full changes. So how would this look like in, a, in an experiment where we know what's going on? Let's take this one here. It's an experiment where people have stimulated cells with dexamethasone. And we're looking here at, at five genes that are known targets of the glucocorticoid receptor, which are known to be transcriptionally upregulated when you, when you stimulate the cells. And you can see that in, for all of these five genes, you see that upregulation at both levels. You see the intron going up, and you see also the exon going up, which is what you would expect for a transcriptional process. If you look at experiments where there is no transcriptional change, but there is a post-transcriptional effect, like transfection of siRNAs, we don't expect the transcription of the gene to change because the siRNA would presumably only hit the mature RNA in the cytoplasm 
knocking down the steady state level, but without affecting the transcription. And that's exactly what we see. We see a decrease of the exonic levels, but hardly any change for at the level of the introns. So this is kind of the overall summary of this second part of the talk. <clears throat> if you remember that, then, then you got basically everything. So let me show you that in a bit more detail. We were looking at, at many different systems to, to see if this generalizes. This one is from, from a paper where they studied macrophage activation using lipid A in vitro, and where they, where they separated the chromatin-associated RNA from the cytoplasmic RNA and sequenced them separately. And in that paper, in cell, they, they discovered different groups of genes that have different response profiles after the stimulation. <clears throat> For example, uh, these would react a bit more early, these would react a bit more later. And you can see that usually the reaction is seen first at the level of chromatin in the nucleus and only later in the cytoplasm. So now, luckily, they also did total RNA sequencing of the unfractionated cells. So we took that data and we split it in silico into exonic and intronic. And you can see that the exonic fraction follows more the, the cytoplasm profile, while the intronic fraction follows more the nuclear profile. So without doing the experimental separation. Let's look at yet another example. Um, mouse circadian rhythm. In the liver, there's known to be about a thousand genes that actually cycle with, with, in, with a daily rhythm. And, and we took a data set where they did nascent RNA-seq. That means sequencing the, the chromatin-associated RNA. And we, we detected oscillating genes in that nascent RNA-seq data set. And we found about 800 using our cutoffs. And we're sorting them here by their phase. So basically by when during the day they peak in their expression from early to late. If you look at the levels of mRNA-seq reads in introns and exons, for the same genes in the same order, and then you get these heat maps. You see the different samples that they've taken with sampling interval of about four hours. And you can see those, those cycling genes, right? You can see two waves of expression because the overall data set is, is over two days. And if you look very closely, you see, you see even more than that. Look, for example, at the genes down here. They have their peak expression in the second sample in the second time point if you look at the level of introns. But if you look at the level of exons, actually the peak is a bit later. It's maybe between the second and the third sample. So you can basically see a delay of the signal in the introns versus the signal in the exons, indicating that there is a time in between. And probably we could explain this by the time it takes for, for an mRNA, once it's upregulated in the nucleus, to be matured and exported until we see the rise of the cytoplasmic level of that mRNA. If you quantify this delay um, versus the nascent seq that directly measures nascent transcription, you see that the intronic level is, is basically not shifted, or if anything, even earlier than what they get with nascent seq, while the exonic is, is almost two hours later. We were a bit surprised that it's such a long, such a long time. So we looked at additional circadian rhythm data sets, um, and we found similar estimates. So in most cases, Exxon was lagging behind one and a half, up to two hours after the intronic levels. And that's like a third example I'd like to show you, again, supporting the, the no notion that if you look at intronic changes, what you're seeing is transcriptional rate changes. That's a data set of fibroblasts stimulated with TNF-alpha. And they performed growth seq in this case. And we compared the change of growth seq, which would directly measure transcription rate changes, with the introns. And you see you get a very nice correlation. And the correlation is less linear, and it's also less, less uh, 
prominent if you compare two exon exchanges. So taking these things all together, I think they, they support the fact that you can really see transcriptional changes, transcription rate changes by, by doing this exon versus intron analysis. So let's think about post-transcriptional changes for a moment. The, the simplest model you could assume about how a gene is regulated would be this, right? It doesn't get simpler than that. The changes of the mRNA level is determined by the transcription rate, what's newly made, minus what's degraded. And let's assume there is just, just a, a rate for each of these two processes. At steady state, so when the amount that is made equals the amount that is degraded, you get, you get this relationship. So the steady state level should be the ratio of these two rates. And since we're looking at this in log space, we're, we're looking at log fold changes, basically means that the, the log fold change of the steady state level is the log fold change of the transcription rate minus the log fold change of the degradation rate. So now I've, I've just shown you that the transcription rate change we can measure by getting the log fold change in the introns and that the overall exonic level corresponds to the steady state you have in the cytoplasm. So basically, if we subtract these two, we should get, we should get the change in, in half-life or the change in transcription, uh, sorry, post-transcriptional uh, regulation of that gene. Half-life is, of course, inversely proportional to the degradation rate. So let's see if that, if that actually holds up if we look at data. <clears throat> We didn't find many data sets where we had both RNA-seq and measurement of half-lives, but we had one such data set in-house. It's, a, it's a, again Dirk Schubler's lab who differentiates embryonic stem cells to neurons in vitro. And here you see the intronic versus exonic changes across this differentiation. You see that it's really highly correlated indicating that most of the things that are going on in this differentiation are actually regulated at a transcriptional level. Nevertheless, you see there is some, some spread around the diagonal, so maybe these small residuals you would get here could be indicative of post-transcriptional regulation. And so what we do is we subtract the, the two and correlate them to the changes in half-life that were experimentally measured using actinomycin D inhibition of the normal transcription and it looks pretty bad I admit but nevertheless it's a it's a significant correlation that you find and what kind of convinced me that it's not it's not trivial to see this is the fact that we get this about 0.3 correlation coefficient when we compare half-lives to delta exon minus delta intron we get a much lower correlation when we just compare to, to delta exon. And we get no correlation at all with delta intron, which of course you wouldn't expect because it's cytoplasm post-transcriptional versus transcription in the nucleus. And that's not trivial at all because overall, delta exon and delta intron are very highly correlated with each other. So we think that's a, that's a rather low correlation coefficient because it's technically difficult to measure, to measure half-lives. Um, taking this one step further, where can, you, where can you use that kind of information? For example, if you're after identification of microRNA targets. This is usually done by transfecting a microRNA into a cell and then measuring the RNA. You would expect that the targets of that microRNA are down-regulated. And that's exactly what you see here. So again, I'm showing you change at the intronic level versus change at the exonic level. You see, most genes don't react 12 hours after transfection of the microRNA. Some genes get down-regulated, but only in the cytoplasm. So that would be your microRNA targets. In this data set, they also looked at the RNA a bit later, namely 32 hours after transfection. And you can see that the picture is quite different here. We still have, it's actually the same genes, the microRNA targets down here. But now, in addition, we start appearance of a correlation here, or maybe you cannot, 
see some genes are starting to migrate out along the diagonal. So correlated changes at intronic and exonic levels. So what does that mean? We think it's actually secondary effects that tend to be transcriptional. And, and what supports this assumption is that if you, if you look at the local density of, of seeds, so genes that have a seed match with microRNA1, you see that they tend to be down here, also here, but not at all along the diagonal. So if, if that's true, that, that, that would mean we should be able to, to discriminate primary from secondary targets by playing this exon intron game. And that's kind of what you see here. So that's a, a larger data set where they transfected two microRNAs in four different cell types. And we, we ordered them here kind of from no secondary effects to more and more secondary effects. And, and we also checked, so how good would we enrich for seed containing um, transcripts if we are selecting them based on delta exon minus delta intron, which is our proposed method to, to measure post-transcriptional effects, or if we just select them based on the delta exon, which is the black line, which is what people usually do in the literature. You see that in the absence of secondary effects, you actually don't do better by doing delta exon minus delta intron. In this case, you even do worse, significantly worse, because probably you're just adding noise to, to your signal. There are no secondary effects, so you don't need to correct for anything. But as soon as you do have secondary effects, you see you do as well or even significantly better than just using delta exon to select your microRNA targets. And uh, this is kind of an extreme case. The genes that change most on the exonic level are actually not microRNA targets in this experiment. If you take gradient of these cells, you go from the normal ploid to the higher ploid? The question was if, if there could be maybe a gradient of ploides in these cells. Um, that's a good question. I don't know. We were wondering why if we order them this way, by basically correlation coefficient between delta exon and delta intron, why do we get the two microRNAs from the same cell together? I don't think it's by chance, but what actually drives this? One thing we also assumed would, was that it could be the, the speed of metabolization, how quickly the microRNAs are taken up and integrated into risk that differs between these cells that then kind of create an asymmetry in how fast the targets react. But yeah, we don't really know. And uh, since we were talking about microRNAs, let me show you a last piece of data about those. Um, people have argued that you should be able to learn microRNA expression just from RNA-seq or RNA expression um, because in the tissues that have a high level of a microRNA, the target should be low. So if you do the analysis across many tissues, you should kind of learn which microRNAs are high in, in a specific tissue. That kind of worked for some people, and other people claimed it doesn't work. So we repeated that very simply by, by fitting a linear model and using the number of predicted microRNA target sites per gene as our regressors. And as a response variable, either delta intron or delta exon, or what we would think would, should work best, delta exon minus delta intron. So the, the parameters that we're fitting essentially are the predicted expression levels or activities of a microRNA in a given tissue. And I'm showing you just an example <clears throat> for three microRNAs or families of microRNAs that share the same seed. Um, MIR 124 here, which is known to be highly and specifically expressed in brain, you see that we really get the most significant coefficient for delta exon minus delta intron. Kind of also sees it in the delta exon, but doesn't see anything at all in the delta intron. Or we have MIR1, which is expressed in heart and skeletal muscle. In this case, both delta exon and delta exon minus delta intron work. Or here, MIR122, which is a liver-specific microRNA, which we can also detect using this approach. <clears throat>
So with that, I'm almost at the end. <clears throat> um, if you want to calculate p-values, some people really like p-values. We, we, we were suggesting, actually forced by the reviewers, suggesting in the paper that one could maybe use the GLM framework to do this, like it's implemented in Edge R. Um, without going into details, what we're basically doing is we're fitting two models, one that explains the ex observed expression data just in terms of the conditions, in this case ESLs versus terminal neurons, plus whether the counts are coming from exons or introns of any given gene. And we're comparing that to, to a model that has, in addition, an interaction term, which kind of makes the model able to to account for things, for changes that are different in exons than in introns. So geometrically, what we're basically modeling with this term, we're giving the genes the, the freedom to move away from the diagonal, to decouple the exonic changes from the intronic changes. And that's kind of, as I've showed you in the last plots, that's how you see a post-transcriptional effect. right? Um, so, so with that, you can calculate p-values, and if I color them in this scatter plot, you see that would be the ones that this model says are significantly post-transcriptionally regulated. We think there is a few drawbacks. For example, this, this model fits a mean variance relationship, and it's assuming that that's the same in introns and in exons, which, if you look at it, is not too far, but is probably not true. So maybe there is room for improvement here. That's just a, a suggestion. Um, something else that we were surprised of, um, you would think that in poly-A selected RNA-seq data sets, you shouldn't find so many reads mapping to introns. In fact, we still do. And, and as you can see here, I'm, I'm plotting here the number of reads you, you have in a, in a data set versus the number of genes you can quantify using some arbitrary cutoff, comparing poly-A data sets with total RNA-seq data sets, they're actually not that different for reasons that we don't really understand. But it's basically just to encourage you, if you only have poly-A selected data, it may still be applicable to your data, this approach. And with that, um, I'm at the end. I hope I could convince you that it's worth looking at both exons and introns, especially if you're interested in transcriptional or post-transcriptional regulation. And I would like to thank you for your attention.